Chapter 11, Grover Gets a Lamborghini. We were crossing the Potomac when we spotted the helicopter. It was a sleek black military model, just like the one we'd seen at Westover Hall, and it was coming straight toward us. They know the van, I said. We have to ditch it. Zoe swerved into the fast lane. The helicopter was gaining. Maybe the military will, sh will shoot it down, Grover said hopefully. The military probably thinks it's one of theirs, I said. How can the general use mortals anyway? Mercenaries. Zoe said bitterly, it is distasteful, but many mortals will fight for any cause as long as they are paid. But don't these mortals see who they're working for? I asked. Don't they notice all the monsters around them? Zoe shook her head. I do not know how much they see through the mist. I doubt it would matter to them if they knew the truth. Sometimes mortals can be more horrible than monsters. The helicopter kept coming, making a lot better time than we were through DC traffic. Talia closed her eyes and prayed hard. Hey, Dad, a lightning bolt would be nice about now, please. But the sky stayed gray and snowy, no sign of a helpful thunderstorm. There, Bianca said, that parking lot. We'll be trapped, Zoe said. Trust me, Bianca said. Zoe shot across two lanes of traffic and into a mall parking lot on the south bank of the river. We left the van and followed Bianca down some steps. Subway entrance, Bianca said. Let's go south, Alexandria. Anything, Talia agreed. We brought tickets and got through the turnstiles, looking behind us for any signs of pursuit. A few minutes later, we were safely aboard a southbound train, riding away from DC. As our train came above ground, we could see the helicopter circling the parking lot, but it didn't come after us. Grover let out a sigh. Nice job, Bianca, thinking of the subway. Bianca looked pleased. Yeah, well, I saw that station when Nico and I came through last summer. I remember being really surprised to see it, because it wasn't here when we used to live in DC. Grover frowned. New, but that station looked really old. I guess, Bianca said, but trust me, when we lived here as little kids, there was no subway. Talia sat forward. Wait a minute, no subway at all? Bianca nodded. Now, I knew nothing about DC, but I didn't see how their whole subway system could be less than 12 years old. I guess everyone else was thinking the same thing because they looked pretty confused. Bianca, Zoe said, how long ago? Her voice faltered. The sound of the helicopter was getting louder. We need to change trains, I said. Next station? Over the next half hour, all we thought about was getting away safely. We changed trains twice. I had no idea where we were going, but after a while we lost the helicopter. Unfortunately, when we finally got off the train, we found ourselves at the end of the line, in an industrial area with nothing but warehouses and railway tracks. And snow. Lots of snow. It seemed much colder here, I was glad for my new lion's fur coat. We wandered through the railway yard, thinking there might be another passenger train somewhere, but there was just rows and rows of freight cars, most of which were covered in snow, like they hadn't been moved in years. A homeless guy was standing at a trash can fire. We must have looked pretty pathetic, because he gave us a toothless grin and said, Y'all need to get warmed up? Come on over. We huddled around his fire. Talia's teeth were chattering. She said, well, this is g g great. My hooves are frozen, Grover complained. Feet, I corrected, for the sake of the homeless guy. Maybe we should contact camp, Bianca said. Chiron, no, Zoe said. They cannot help us anymore. We must finish this quest ourselves. I gazed miserably around the rail yard. Somewhere, far to the west, Annabeth was in danger. Artemis was in chains. A doomsday monster was on the loose, and we were stuck on the outskirts of D.C., sharing a homeless person's fire. You know, the homeless man said, you're never completely without friends. His face was grimy and his beard tangled, but his expression seemed kindly. You kids need a train going west? Yes, sir, I said. You know of any? He pointed one greasy hand. Suddenly, I noticed a freight train, gleaming and free of snow. It was one of those automobile carrier trains with steel mesh curtains and a triple deck of cars inside. The side of the freight train said, Sun West Line. That's convenient, Talia said. Thanks, uh. She turned to the homeless guy, but he was gone. The trash can in front of us was cold and empty, as if he'd taken the flames with him. An hour later, we were rumbling west. There was no problem about who would drive now, because we all got our own luxury car. Zoe and Bianca were crashed out in a Lexus on the top deck. 
Grover was playing race car by driver behind the wheel of a Lamborghini, and Talia had hot-wired the radio in a black Mercedes SLK so she could pick up the alt-rock stations from D.C. Join you? I asked her. She shrugged, so I climbed into the shotgun seat. The radio was playing the white stripes. I knew the song because it was one of the only CDs I owned that my mom liked. She said it reminded her of Led Zeppelin. Thinking about my mom made me sad, because it didn't seem likely I'd be home for Christmas. I might not live that long. Nice coat, Talia told me. I pulled the brown duster around me, thankful for the warmth. Yeah, but the Mimi and Lion wasn't the monster we're looking for. Not even close. We've got a long way to go. Whatever this mystery monster is, the general said it would come for you. They wanted to isolate you from the group, so the monster would appear and battle you one-on-one. He said that? Well, something like that, yeah. That's great. I love being used as bait. No idea what the monster might be? She shook her head morosely. But you know where we're going, don't you? San Francisco. That's where Artemis was heading. I remembered something Annabeth had said at the dance. How her dad was moving to San Francisco, and there was no way she could go. Half-bloods couldn't live there. Why? I asked. What's so bad about San Francisco? The mist is really thick there because of the mountain of despair so near. Titan magic, what's left of it, still lingers. Monsters are attracted to that area like you wouldn't believe. What's the mountain of despair? Talia raised her eyebrow. You really don't know? Ask stupid Zoe, she's the expert. She glared out the windshield. I wanted to ask her what she was talking about, but I also didn't want to sound like an idiot. I hated feeling like Talia knew more than I did, so I kept my mouth shut. The afternoon sun shone through the steel mesh side of the freight car, casting a, sha- casting a shadow across Talia's face. I thought about how different she was from Zoe. Zoe all formal and aloof, like a princess. Talia with her ratty clothes and her rebel attitude. But there was something similar about them too. The same kind of toughness. Right now, sitting in the shadows with a gloomy expression, Talia looked a lot like one of the hunters. Then suddenly, it hit me. That's why you don't get along with Zoe. Talia frowned. What? The hunters tried to recruit you. I guessed. Her eyes got dangerously bright. I thought she was going to zap me out of the Mercedes, but she just sighed. I almost joined them, she admitted. Luke, Annabeth, and I ran into them once, and Zoe tried to convince me. She almost did, but... But? Talia's fingers gripped the wheel. I would have had to leave Luke. Oh. Zoe and I got into a fight. She told me I was being stupid. She said I'd regret my choice. She said Luke would let me down someday. I watched the sun through the metal curtain. We seemed to be traveling faster each second, shadows flickering like an old movie projector. That's harsh, I said. Hard to admit Zoe was right. She wasn't right. Luke never let me down, never. We'll have to fight him, I said. There's no way around it. Talia didn't answer. You haven't seen him lately, I warned. I know it's hard to believe, but I'll do what I have to do. Even if that means killing him? Do me a favor, she said. Get out of my car. I felt so bad for her, I didn't argue. I was about to leave. She said, Percy? When I looked back, her eyes were red, but I couldn't tell if it was from anger or sadness. Annabeth wanted to join the hunters, too. Maybe you should think about why. Before I could respond, she raised the power windows and shut me out. I sat in the driver's seat of Grover's Lamborghini. Grover was asleep in the back. He'd finally given up trying to impress Zoe and Bianca with his pipe music after he played Poison Ivy and caused that very stuff to sprout from their Lexus's air conditioner. As I watched the sun go down, I thought of Annabeth. I was afraid to go to sleep. I was worried what I might dream. Oh, don't be afraid of dreams, a voice said right next to me. I looked over. Somehow, I wasn't surprised to find the homeless guy from the rail yard sitting in the shotgun seat. His jeans were so worn out they were almost white. His coat was ripped with stuffing coming out. He looked kind of like a teddy bear that had been run over by a truck. If it weren't for dreams, he said, I wouldn't know half the things I know about the future. They're better than Olympus tabloids. He cleared his throat, then held up his hands dramatically. Dreams like a podcast, downloading truth in my ears. They tell me cool stuff. Apollo, I guessed because I figured nobody else could make a haiku that bad. He put his fingers to his lips. I'm incognito. Call me Fred. 
a god named Fred? Eh, well. Zeus insists on certain rules. Hands off when there's the human quest, even when something really major is wrong. But nobody messes with my baby sister. Nobody. Can you help us then? Shh. I already have. Haven't you been looking outside? The train? How fast are we moving? Apollo chuckled. Fast enough. Unfortunately, we're running out of time. It's almost sunset, but I imagine we'll get you across a good chunk of America, at least. But where is Artemis? His face darkened. I know a lot, and I see a lot, but even I don't know that. She's clouded for me. I don't like it. And Annabeth? He frowned. Oh, you mean that girl you lost? Hmm, I don't know. I tried not to feel mad. I knew the gods had a hard time taking mortals seriously, even half-bloods. We lived such short lives compared to the gods. What about the monster Artemis was seeking? I asked. Do you know what it is? No, Apollo said. But there is one who might. If you haven't yet found the monster when you reach San Francisco, seek out Nereus, the old man of the sea. He has a long memory and a sharp eye. He has a gift of knowledge sometimes kept obscure from my oracle. But it's your oracle, I protested. Can't you tell us what the prophecy means? Apollo sighed. You might as well ask an artist to explain his art or ask a poet to explain his poem. It defeats the purpose. The meaning is only clear through the search. In other words, you don't know. Apollo checked his watch. Ah, look at the time. I have to run. I doubt I can risk helping you again, Percy. But remember what I said. Get some sleep. And when you return, I expect a good haiku about your journey. I wanted to protest that I wasn't tired and I'd never made a haiku in my life, but Apollo snapped his fingers and the next thing I knew I was closing my eyes. In my dream, I was somebody else. I was wearing an old-fashioned Greek tunic, which was a little too breezy downstairs, and laced leather sandals. The Nemean lion skin was wrapped around my back like a cape, and I was running somewhere, being pulled along by a girl who was tightly gripping my hand. Hurry, she said. It was too dark to see her face clearly, but I could hear the fear in her voice. He will find us. It was nighttime. A million stars blazed above. We were running through tall grass, and the scent of a thousand different flowers made the air intoxicating. It was a beautiful garden, and yet the girl was leading me through it, as if we were about to die. I am not afraid, I tell her. You should be, she said, pulling me along. She had long, dark hair braided down her back. Her silk robes glowed faintly in the starlight. We raced up the side of the hill. She pulled me behind a thorn bush and we collapsed, both breathing heavily. I didn't know why the girl was so scared. The garden seemed so peaceful, and I felt strong, stronger than I'd ever felt before. There is no need to run, I told her. My voice sounded deeper, much more confident. I have bested a thousand monsters with my bare hands. Not this one, the girl said. Ladon is too strong. You must go around, up the mountain to my father. It is the only way. The hurt in her voice surprised me. She was really concerned, almost like she cared about me. I don't trust your father, I said. You should not, the girl agreed. You will have to trick him, but you cannot take the prize directly. You will die. I chuckled. Then why don't you help me, pretty one? I, I am afraid. Ladin will stop me. My sisters, if they found out, they would disown me. Then there's nothing for it. I stood up, rubbing my hands together. Wait, the girl said. She seemed to be agonizing over a decision. Then, her fingers trembling, she reached up and plucked a long white brooch from her hair. If you must fight, take this. My mother, Pleione, gave it to me. She was a daughter of the ocean, and the ocean's power is within it. My immortal power. The girl breathed on the pin and it glowed faintly. It gleamed in the starlight like polished abalone. Take it, she told me and make of it a weapon. I laughed. A hairpin? How will this slay Ladon, pretty one? It may not, she admitted, but it is all I can offer if you insist on being stubborn. The girl's voice softened my heart. I reached down and took the hairpin, and as I did, it grew longer and heavier in my hand until I held a familiar bronze sword. Well balanced, I said, though I usually prefer to use my bare hands. What shall I name this blade? Anaclusmos, the girl said sadly, the current that takes one by surprise. And before you know it, you have been swept out to sea. Before I could thank her, 
There was a trampling sound in the grass, a hiss like air escaping a tire, and the girl said, Too late! He is here! I sat bolt upright in the Lamborghini's driver's seat. Grover was shaking my arm. Percy, he said, it's morning. The train stopped. I tried to shake off my drowsiness. Talia, Zoe, and Bianca had already rolled up the metal curtains. Outside were snowy mountains dotted with pine trees, the sun rising red between two peaks. I fished my pen out of my pocket and stared at it. Anaklusmos, the ancient Greek name for riptide. A different form, but I was sure it was the same blade I'd seen in my dream. And I was sure of something else, too. The girl I had seen was Zoe Nightshade.